Praise the Lord. It's the word of God. If you want to open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 14. 1 Chronicles chapter 14. Praise the Lord. And we are beginning a series that I believe is going to be a powerful series. It's called Breakthrough, Breakthrough, Breakthrough. And, and we're going to be talking about some, some breakthroughs. And I believe that I'm standing before people that um, are always praying and believing God for some breakthroughs in our lives. And I will explain a little bit on that. But if you go to First Chronicles chapter 14 and verse 8, we begin reading there a couple of verses. This is uh, 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 David, uh, 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 one of the most powerful kings that ever lived. And uh, this is what the Bible says here on this account. He says, on verse 8, he says, When the Philistines, this was uh, uh, God's enemy number one, um, especially at that time, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all of Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went out to meet them. Now the Philistines had come and raided the valley of Rephaim. Uh, so David inquired of God, so like go and attack the Philistines. Will you hand them over to me? The Lord answered him, go, I will hand them over to you. So David and his men went up to Bel Parazim, and there he defeated them. He said, as waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Bel Parazim. The Philistines had abandoned their gods there, and David gave orders to burn them in the fire. Father, we thank you, and I pray that somehow, Lord God, that this portion of Scripture will become a life to every one of us. That we will understand the principles, God, that you use for breakthroughs in our lives. And I pray for breakthroughs all throughout these next few weeks, God, that you'll be able to touch people's lives and families and marriages and even physical bodies, Lord, that have been sick and ill for a while. I pray for miracles, God. I will remove every obstacle, Jesus, that, that, that is in front of us, Lord God, holding us back from these breakthroughs. And we declare, my God, breakthroughs, miracles, signs, and wonders, Lord, in your church, in your house today. And we give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to be talking about breakthroughs. Glory to God. How many need a breakthrough in the house of God? Many of us need breakthroughs. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. But I start with the definition of a breakthrough. The definition of a breakthrough, I... I got it, I think it was in the Webster Dictionary, and I was able to see the definition of a breakthrough, and that is the act of breaking through an obstacle, all right? That's one definition. It is the act of breaking through an obstacle. It's called a breakthrough. In warfare, in, uh, it, 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 it's got another definition. It's just an offensive thrust that penetrates and carries beyond a defensive line in warfare. In other words, it is when, 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 when you face opposition and at some point you're able to penetrate to the other side, that is a breakthrough. Now, if that is a breakthrough coming in uh, and, and they're showing me the outlines for this message, if you need the outline, the three points I'm going to bring out and you didn't get one, the ushers have those available. If you raise up your hand, if you need one so that you can follow along with me, just raise up your hand, they'll quickly go and get you one. But... The opposite of breakthrough, my friend, the opposite of breakthrough is a setback or a stronghold. A setback or a stronghold. That's the opposite of a breakthrough. Now, a setback, listen, a setback is a problem, a problem that makes progress more difficult or success less likely. That is a setback. So if God wants to give you a breakthrough, there are always things that try to keep you from receiving your breakthrough, especially in the Lord, especially in Christianity, especially walking with God. There are setbacks, problems that makes your life or your progress very difficult or makes success less likely in your Christian walk. If you want to start a business and you're going to glorify God, through your business, there will be obstacles that you're going to face, and the enemy is very good at making sure that you will face those things so that you will not accomplish what God 
is called you to accomplish. That's his job to make it difficult for a Christian to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. Also, there are strongholds that will try to keep you from receiving the breakthroughs that God has ordained for your life. A stronghold is a protected place where the members of a military group stay and can defend themselves against attacks from the enemy. These are strongholds. Now, when we talk about, you know, our Christian walk and, and a, a life, a walk of faith, there are strongholds and areas that the enemy would like to occupy in our lives and, and, and begin to think that he owns those areas in our lives. That's why the definition of a stronghold is a protected place where the members of a military group stay and can defend themselves against attacks. We've seen that in, 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 in First and Second Samuel when they would fight. There was, there was the certain people that would choose these places, especially real high where, where there was like mountains or hills, and they would, they, would, they would build their headquarters there, and those would become the strongholds, areas that would be very difficult for anybody to take over or to overcome simply because they were at a high altitude like that, and they would see the enemy coming from a distance. So because of that, you can never come into those places and take over simply because But by the time you got close to their stronghold, the place where they stay, their, their headquarters, they will be prepared to defend it very well. The enemy has placed in your life and in my certain strongholds that he placed inside of us because of our upbringing. When you was, you, when you, before you came to the Lord, there were some areas that the enemy attacked pretty bad. He tried to destroy you. He tried to keep you down. And even now that you have come to, to know Jesus and now you, you are saved and you're serving the Lord, there are certain areas of your life that the enemy likes to think that he owns in your life. There are certain things that people would do and then all of a sudden you're very defensive about certain things. There's a very low self-esteem in your life. Somebody would do something and means nothing and they're not doing it intentionally and you feel offended or perhaps pushed away and pushed us out, rejected because the enemy has placed certain things in your life, in your upbringing, in the world, that now any little thing would trigger that and the enemy likes to think that he owns those areas in your life. He protects those areas and he doesn't want you to have a breakthrough. He doesn't want you to, to, to get a breakthrough in those areas. He wants you to continue to feel sad about yourself, that you continue to feel rejected in life when anything is happening in your life. Then all of a sudden, you, you, you go there and, and, and you develop very unhealthy relationships simply because you react to certain things in certain ways because the enemy has hurt you in areas of your life and now all of a sudden the enemy thinks that he's got those strongholds in your life and that you will never be able to be a healthy Christian or be a healthy person because he's got those areas that he thinks that he owns in your life. Throughout the messages that I'm going to be bringing out, I believe that God is going to be able to heal some of you in those areas of your life that you've been over and over again. The enemy has used those areas to bring you down so that you will not reach your full potential in the things of God. And I believe that God wants to bring in those breakthroughs. Some of us have thought that because our great-grandparents and our grandparents and then our parents and uh, that they had this certain illness or sickness. Now all of a sudden uh, we got to have that sickness because we come from the same lineage, the same family. And the enemy has somehow make you believe, make you believe that because they had it that, that it's just a matter of time before. So now any, 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 any pain on your side or something, you know what it is. Before you even go to the doctor, you already know what it is. But you go to the doctor over and over again, and they say, no, no, I think it was just the hamburger you ate yesterday. <laughs> but you're stubborn. No, no, there's got to be more. Because the enemy put a, a certain stronghold in your life, in your mind. 
thinking that somehow you're going to, you go, you, 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 they're going to find certain things, certain illness in your body because, because, because. And God wants to break those areas. God wants to heal those areas of thinking and letting you know that, listen, it doesn't have to be like that, and it won't be like that, and you're not going to be ill, and that sickness is not going to be upon your life because when I bless somebody, the devil cannot curse what I have blessed. Come on now. Somebody need to give him praise for that. The devil cannot curse what God has blessed. So I pray that throughout these services that you would come understanding that there's a new thing that God's going to establish in your life and in my, mind, in my life. God is doing a new thing. God is doing an awesome thing in our lives. So God is going to break some strongholds. These are some of the barriers that will keep you from a breakthrough. Lack of vision in your life. That because of what you've gone through already in your life, that you don't have a vision about your future. You cannot even think yourself doing better than how you're doing today. Sometimes God has a blessing for your life and you have a problem receiving a blessing. Because of how little you think about yourself. Because of what you've been through. It is a lie from the pit of hell. And we're going to break through those ways of thinking and letting you know that you are a child of God. That the minute you gave your life to Jesus, there was a door that was opened up, not only to make it to heaven now, not only to be an, et an eternity with God, but now there's a door of opportunities that you can become great, that you can be a powerful man and woman of God simply because now you have become a child of God. So now, lack of vision and thinking very little about ourselves can be something that will keep us from receiving the blessings and the breakthroughs that God has for our lives. The devil uses guilt so much in your life and in my life. Guilt about the past, about some mistakes, about things that you've done, things that, 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 that you was involved in, broken relationships that taking place and, and all these different things. And the enemy would want to just inject you with guilt and keeping you like a little puppy, right? Just carry you whatever he wants to carry you and he will tell you to, to feel in a certain way simply because of the guilt in your life. And yet, yet when the word of God says that, 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 that if you come to Christ, you are a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away and behold, everything has become new. You read that, but now they don't, it doesn't really, you don't really apply it. You don't believe it because the enemy is on the other side reminding you and bringing the guilt of all the bad that you've done, the children that you lost, the relationships. It was your fault of that happened and that happened and that happened. And you can't move forward and become everything that God called you to become. And even when you get excited and God touches you and you try to move forward, the enemy pulls you with that string and the rope of guilt in your life. And God says, this month I will give you a breakthrough. This time I'm going to cut through the madness and set you free to become what God is calling you to become. Come on, somebody need to give a praise. I was praying all week and I said, God, heal me so I can preach this message. A little sick and the other day and man, my voice was really bad. And now I'm able to do a little better. So pray I don't get that excited. No, I'm just kidding. Amen. But guilt of the past, memories of the past, mistakes that you have made, always make you think that you're not going to become, that you can't be, and you don't have no dreams about yourself. And the Bible says that without vision, the people perish. The Bible says without vision, people will perish. Meaning if you don't have dreams about a better tomorrow, you going to begin to die and get, ah, oh, well, life is not that good. But if you have visions about, man, things are going to get better. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to reach my full potential in life. I'm going to be everything God called me to be. 
as a father, as a mother, as a daughter, as a student, as a child of God, as a businessman, as a whatever he may be. I'm going to keep on climbing. I'm going to keep on doing what God called me to do. When you have a vision, a better vision for the future, then the devil cannot get in your way. He can't stop you. But you can stop yourself if you allow the guilt, if you allow the shame, if you allow the memory of the past. If you allow the mistakes to keep you down where the enemy wants to keep you. Broken relationships, bad decisions, wasted years, wasted years. Some people say, man, I wasted so many years, man, doing this and this and that. Now, you know, I can't really, you know, I'll come to church. But, and God says, uh-uh, I can still use you mightily. I still have a plan for you no matter what. But people, it, it's hard for people to believe because they wasted many years and now the enemy uses that to let them know that they will never become what God's saying that they could become. Don't come and tell Abraham that. Abraham had 100, was it 100, 101 or something like that? He still had a child promise, the promised child, and did wonderful things. So don't ever think that you're too old, that you wasted too much time. When you get saved, it's a great time. To become everything that God called you to become. God still has a plan for your life. Young and old alike. In fact, you should run even stronger for Jesus now. Huh? You, when Jesus comes back, you want to be running for Jesus? Not from Jesus, for Jesus. <laughs> right? You don't want to run in from Jesus. No! Running with Jesus. When he comes back. In the ministry, in the church, there are some setbacks and strongholds that the enemy would use. Lack of vision in the church. Lack of vision in the church. The church will never grow anywhere. The church will never make a difference without a vision. That's why I, I bring this out in front of you. Some of the things that are happening. I want you to have a vision. God's going to continue to expand. God's going to continue to grow. God's going to continue to reach people through your life and mine. Not only here, but in Utah. Hello, somebody. In Ukiah and all North Bay, everywhere, right? And then God's going to raise some of you up so that you can go. God, is, God has a calling upon some of you guys' lives to be ministers of the gospel, to be pastors, to be evangelists, to be teachers, that you will go not only here in the North Bay, but around the world. This is a ministry that believes in preaching this gospel and taking the hope of God all over the world. I believe that some of you are going to be in other countries someday. You're going to be a minister of the gospel, establishing works and, and churches for the honor and the glory of God. Some of us don't believe that no more because what we've been through. Some of us don't even accept that anymore because what we've been through. But I want to let you know that, yes, God wants you to continue to work and continue to do what you're doing right now. But he wants you to also understand that there is a greater calling upon your life that God has for you to make a difference, to be able to bring life to those that are lifeless, to be able to give hope to those that are hopeless, to be able to let them know that there is a better way, that you was lost and you was bound, but God set you free so that you can settle the people free as well. Come on, give him a good praise. God has a plan for our lives. He does have a plan of our lives. Lack of leadership can be a setback in any church, any ministry. Lack of facilities or buildings can be all of that. And praise God, we do have a nice facility, so we don't have to worry about that. Lack of finances. Hello, somebody. Finances are important in any church, any ministry, especially a ministry that has a vision. That's why I challenge every one of you all the time. Be a tither. Contribute just like everybody else that is doing. Let's put it together. Together we can make a difference. We don't want 20% of people contributing and the other 80%, you know, going on a free ride. Hello. No, Jesus paid the price for all of us. He shed blood for every one of us. And if he shed blood for each and every one of us, we got to be thankful to him. 
every one of us. And out of our gratitude, we say, God, I want to be obedient. Not only do I want to be obedient, I'm grateful. And out of that gratitude in my heart, I want to be able to make a difference in other people's lives as well. And we come together and we establish a strong base in the area of resources and finances. And we continue to expand the church and God's kingdom all throughout the North Bay and around the world. That's how it's going to happen. Some of you already, the enemy has placed some strongholds in your mind. And every time somebody talks about tithes and offerings, right away you start, you know, start feeling funny. Right? Oh, man, I knew it. I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The pastor wants to buy rims for his car again. Right? I, I mean, I, I'm not afraid to talk about any of this uh, stuff. Because I, I, I've been set free. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I've been set free. I've been accused of all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, I've been like, 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 you know, people talk and all that stuff. I, I didn't know what Pastor Steve uh, uh, meant when, when he used to say, I man, you want to talk about me? Get in line. And then he was saying, and, and, and the, the, the back of the line is about, about two blocks down the street. Get in line. I didn't know what that meant. But, but when, you, when you begin to do something for God, and the more that you do for God, and the more that you want to do for God, and the more that you go forward, the more critics that will come up. Every time you want to do something with your very own life, is it at work, anywhere that you go, every time you want to excel in life, anytime you want to succeed in life, anytime you cross the line and say, I'm not going to be like the norm. I'm going to go ahead and go for it. I'm going to go for the finish line. I'm going to build something. I'm going to be the best father there is. I'm going to be the best mother there is. I'm going to work. I'm going to be faithful in my job. I'm going to be able to do the right thing. Every time you do that and you break from the crowd, there's going to be haters that are going to come against you and can I tell you something you can't pay attention to them if you pay attention to them you will stay with the turkeys you will stay down and low but if you want to soar with the eagles you got to say forget it For I'm going to go for it I'm going to keep on doing what God called me to do irregardless of what people think So in the position that God has given me, there's a lot of people that love to have a target. And they find me as a target all the time. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I can take it out. At the beginning, I used to be like, I couldn't sleep at night. I can't believe it. People are talking about me. They don't love me. Oh, my God, they don't love me. <laughs> I mean, there could be 200 people in the room and, and, and one of them says something negative and that one will kill me. I didn't think about the other 100 and, 149 people that, that were saying good things. The thing that would destroy me was the one that didn't like me or said something. And I learned to deal with that. And then, and then they started talking about my kids. And I heard something, oh, God, who's talking about, what? So I choked two people. No, I'm just kidding, amen, amen, I'm just kidding. But it will get me all the time, man. Talk about my wife, talk about my kids. I'm like, oh, God. But every time that you put yourself in a place where you're going to make a difference at something, you, you, you're going to receive criticism. And that's just, that's just the, the, the human factor, sin. And so you got to understand that, that God wants something great for your life, but you got to overcome those things. If you don't overcome those things, you would always go and try to do the best, and then you hear people, the critics and all that, and you always go back a couple steps and mingle with the rest of the critics to stay just the same. And you can't do that in the kingdom of God. When God wants to reach People all throughout the North Bay, we're going to need eagles that are ready to take off 
And other people try to pull you back and try to say, you never do it. Who you think you are? Do you know where you come from? You don't even have education. You don't even have this. You don't even have that. Oh, man, look at You was in jail before. You was all this and that. How can you take off like that? You can, God can never use your life. You need to just go ahead and, and say, say whatever you want, but I'm going to allow God. I'm going to enter into the new arena. I'm going to move forward into what God has for me. I'm going to make a difference in my life. I'm going to reach for the high calling of Christ Jesus in my life. I'm not going to let the critics keep me down. Come on now. Somebody need to give him praise. Somebody need to give him praise. Some of you are going to begin to cross the line and say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of staying the same just because the way I think, uh, just because the enemy, I'm going to move, I'm going to cross the line, I'm going to become what God called me to become. Somebody, come on, give a praise. You got to overcome these things that come against you in your thoughts, in your mind. At your job, you want to be faithful and reach that, you know, you're not going to, you're kissy, kissy. No, 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 no. We're not talking about that. I'm talking about being faithful. I'm talking about doing your job and doing it well. I'm talking about respecting those in authority. Every, you don't talk about them, you respect them. When you begin to do that, God opens doors. And when God begins to elevate you, and they're like, come on, I got a position for a manager. I got a position for this because we... God will give you favor. And when you begin to do that and, 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 and like that, the very people that you used to hang around with are the very first ones that are going to come against you. It happens all the time. But don't stay down here just because you're going to experience criticism. You got to overcome those feelings and those emotions in your life. So here the enemy comes against David. And let, let, let's get real quickly here. I got 10 more minutes and, and we're done. Just stay with me. Here in 1 Chronicles 14, 8 through 12, we read about David who had become the new king after the death of Saul. Remember that. Saul, Saul was the former king and he fought hard against the all-time enemies of God. King Saul had fought against the Philistines time and time again. And in his final showdown, he ended up dying under the hands of the Philistines. And for many years, the Philistines had become the problem that made progress more difficult, success less likely for God's chosen people. The Philistines was that, that barrier that was keeping the people of God from receiving their breakthroughs. And here in 1 Chronicles 14, 8 through 12 says that when the Philistines, here we go, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him, but David heard about it and went out to meet them. Now the Philistines had come and raided the valley of Rephaim, so David inquired of God, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, go, I will deliver them into your hands. So David and his men went up to Bel Parasim, and there he defeated them. He said, as waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Bel Parasim. The Philistines had abandoned their gods there, and David gave orders to burn them in the fire. Real quickly, step number one to your breakthrough. We're talking about breakthroughs. Step number one is this. You need to know, number one, that the enemy is afraid of the real you. The enemy is afraid of the real you as God created you. The enemy is afraid. See, sometimes we think, man, the devil is, is, is too much. It's gonna, the devil shakes his, in his boots if you understand who you are. That's why he tries to keep you naive or ignorant of your identity in Christ. He doesn't want you to find out who you really are, who God made you to be. That's why he tries to this. I, I think about the story, and and uh, and, and and maybe uh, m maybe they're in the back. I don't know if you got some of those pictures. It's it's, it's a beautiful car. It's the one day I know I'm gonna have one of them. You can put them up. Come on, put the other ones. It's a it's a beautiful car. Come on, oh, yes, yes, yes. Keep it up. That's my car. Oh no, no, that's not my car. Go, go ahead, one more. 
That's it. What's the matter with you? No, I'm just kidding. Amen. That's a Rolls Royce car. And if you go all the way, now listen, th those, are, those are wonderful cars. That one, the king, the king of Malaysia is, is the owner of that car right there, right there. I, I, I'm talking about vehicles that are $300,000 and more. It, 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 these, are, these, are, these are luxury cars, right? The story goes like this. That, that's the reason why I'm putting them up there. But the story goes that this individual over in Europe somewhere, and it's a true story. It was in the paper years ago. I read it whenever I became, became a Christian two, three years, and, and this had happened. That this individual bought a property, and he was, he was a farmer. And when he went into some of the uh, barns there and everything, he found a car. He didn't know what kind of car it was. He didn't know anything about uh, cars and all that. So he, he, started, he started using that car. It was a little old car, but he ran. It was good. And so he started using it, and he didn't know that it was a Rolls Royce. An old car, that, that was it. I mean, the old cars are beautiful. I, I, was, I was able to, I just couldn't send some pictures, did, didn't uh, uh, go through. But it was some awesome pictures of some, some, some wonderful cars. And he said that he, his truck or something broke down. So what he did was that he got that car that, that was there in the, in the barn, and he made it a convertible car. He cut half, the, the back part of it, making a convertible. He cut it himself to be able to carry everything that he needed to carry, tools, and then sometimes put trash in it and be able to take it to the dumps and, and get rid of that. And he was doing that until somebody from the Rolls Royce manufacturers found out that there was a vehicle that was holding trash in it. And so they came and they found the individual who was driving one of them, and they came to him and they gave him $25,000 for that car just so that they can take it from his hands and that he will not embarrass them again about using that luxury car to carry trash in it. It's a true story. They bought, they bought it with $25,000 they got it and they junked the car and they, 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 they got rid of it. They just didn't want anybody to know that the Rolls Royce manufacturers, a vehicle of theirs, was being used as a pickup truck when the vehicles were actually made to be able to transport kings and, and people of high position. In fact, they will make 500 of them only. They will make 600 of a different kind. This was a very limited edition of these cars. Well, this is exactly what I'm talking to you about this morning. This is exactly what the enemy wants to keep you from. That you will not understand that God made you a Rolls Royce type of individual. The enemy doesn't want you to know that God created you unique and special and valuable. The enemy wants to keep you naive of who you really are. But God is trying to tell you this morning who you really are. Because the minute that you find out who you really are, you got no business carrying trash in you. You got no business dealing with some worldly things in your life. When God called you to operate at this level, we got no business operating at this other level. Right? The enemy is always trying to keep the truth from your life. What is the truth? That you was created in the image of God. The enemy doesn't want you to know that. That before you was in your mother's womb that God knew you. He doesn't want you to know that. That you are his chosen people. A royal priesthood to declare the goodness of God to the world. He doesn't want you to know that. He wants you to be caught up in just carrying garbage like the world does. He doesn't want you to be successful. He doesn't want you to know that we are the top and not the bottom. That we are the head and not the tail. He doesn't want you to know that. Because the minute that you know that, you become a threat against in the kingdom of darkness. He wants to keep you naive. He wants to keep you in a messed up position so that you will never become a threat to the kingdom of darkness. 
So what, so what did he do when we were unsaved, when we didn't know Jesus? He tried to keep you drunk all the time. Drugged up all the time. Depressed, medicated, locked up all the time. Hopeless and discouraged. Why? See, that, he didn't want you to be aware of you being a Rolls Royce. He wanted you to keep on picking up trash, carrying it, and well, this is life. Oh, but what about what God called you to do? Who God called you to be? What do you mean? What do you mean? This is who I am. This is, this is who you made yourself to be. But that doesn't mean that that's what God called you to be. God brought you to this world to operate at this level. And you, because of the problems, situations, limitations, and everything else around you, you are operating at this level when you should be operating at this level. And people don't know that. And the devil thrives on keeping people naive and blind and ignorant to the fact that God, that we are God's creation, that God wanted something special with us, that he loves us so much that he gave his only son to go to the cross and make sure that even though you was lost and bound and you was, you know, uh, lied to and you was on your way to hell, he sent his only son to stop it, to say, no, they're not going that direction, that whoever believes in Jesus Christ, that they're able to be ready rescued and put on a new road in a new direction a direction of success a direction of love and understanding a direction that god only knows the success that is waiting for you come on give him a good praise this morning the devil's plan was to keep you ignorant and away from the truth the bible says when the philistines found out that David was king and was anointed king, they were very upset. They said, no, not David. David king, they were afraid. Why? Because they knew a little bit of history about David. Oh, Jesus, this is where it gets good, so don't go nowhere, all right? Just stay with me. This is where it's going to get better. The enemy knew a little history about David. The enemy knew that David was a courageous young man. That he was not a compromiser. The enemy knew that David, as a youngster, had killed Goliath. Well, nobody wanted to face him. And now he's become king. Uh-oh. He became king. He knows now. He knows now that he has a great measure of authority. David now knows he's got a great measure of authority. No, the enemy says. I don't want him to find out that he's got authority. So the Bible says, the men of the Philistines found out that David had been anointed king. They went crazy. They went, what are we going to do now? They reacted to the news that David finally understood that, hey, wait a minute. I'm not just a little shepherd boy. I'm a king. I'm a king. <laughs> oh, my God. Whoa. I'm a king. The enemy says, no. Now he found out. The enemy gets so upset when you find out who you really are. The enemy gets so upset when he finds out that you know that you're the son and the daughter of a king. The enemy gets upset because he knows that now you know that there's authority in your life. That you have authority. That greater is he that is within us than he who is in the world. The enemy is afraid when he knows that you know that you have authority within you because God has given you that authority. So, so he got upset. He says, man, we know a little bit about David. And if he knows that he's got authority, be careful. Because he's going to come against us like crazy. The devil knows about you. In fact, he had you like a little puppet in the world. He knows what you've been through. He knows how stubborn you was. And he knows how stubborn you still are. But, but now your loyalty, your commitment has shifted 
You're no longer stubborn to doing the wrong and the bad and the ugly out there. Now you're stubborn about doing the things of God that don't matter what trials, don't matter what opposition you may face. Like my pastor Steve used to say, give me a hundred two-year-old boys and I'll take the world. Who would say, what do you mean, pastor? Give me a hundred two-year-old boys and I'll take the world? What do you mean? And he would say, you cannot tell a two-year-old boy no. He will look at you when you say, don't sit right there. You know, they're sitting down right here. They're playing, they're sitting down, and, and they're doing their thing, right? Whatever they're doing. He said, don't sit there. Mommy, mommy. Don't sit there. And then mama goes over there. You can never stop a two-year-old boy from doing what he wants to do just about. That's what Pastor Steve's kind of way of bringing this out. Some of you were so stubborn. But it's just good that you were stubborn in the world because you brought the stubbornness here into the church house now. Some of you have faced some opposition that many of the people that wasn't as stubborn as you have given up already. But you're still here. You know why you're still here? Because you're like that two... Two, 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 two year old boy that would say, uh uh, devil, you cannot stop me from doing what God called me to do. You might have brought these problems. You might have brought all the situations. You might have came with all kinds of opposition. But can I tell you something, devil? You cannot tell me that I'm not going to be able to do what God is called me to do. I need more individuals who come with the attitude of a two-year-old boy that says, watch me do it. If you tell me I can't, I'll prove it to you that it can't be done. This is what we need in the kingdom of God. Come on, give him a good praise. So the enemy knows who you are and he's afraid of you finding out who you really are. Real quickly, secondly, the enemy is terrified of your potential. The enemy is terrified of your potential. Not only the Bible tells us that when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they started reacting. But the Bible tells us, secondly, that they went up in full force to search for him. The minute they found out that he had become anointed king, then they went up in full force to search for him. They wanted to kill him right away. Now, listen, the Philistines knew that Soon, David would have control of the Israelite armies. He would fight against the Philistines. And they wanted to defeat him before he could make Israel strong. He just came into, into, into his new position. He became king. So they said, let's go after him right now before he becomes everything he's going to become. There's so much potential in the young boy assuming the responsibility of a king. But he's, he, he hasn't developed to his full potential yet. Let's kill him before he develops into everything that he's going to develop. See, the Philistines knew that Saul and his son Jonathan were very dear to David. And the Philistines had to kill both. They killed both. Now that David is king, he will want to avenge both of them. The Philistines had it coming and they knew it. They thought that if there was any chance of survival for them was to kill David before he evolved into the powerful anointed leader, the king that he was called to be. They wanted to cut his life short before he became a powerful king. They wanted to destroy him right away. They wanted the job. They wanted him to get fire because they knew the potential that was in David. They were terrified of his potential. And because of it, the minute they found out that he was anointed king, they went up in full force searching for him to kill him. It is at this point, my friend, that the enemy will lie to make you abort your dream. Kill your vision and cut you short of your potential by robbing you of your future. When you understand who you are in Christ... When you come into realization that, you, that God chose you, that God wants to save you, that God loves you, then the enemy will throw all kinds of stuff at you to stop you from becoming everything that God called you to become. Salvation is step number one. You enter into the door to make it to heaven. 
You see, getting saved by acknowledging your sins and repenting and asking Jesus for forgiveness is great. But that only opens the door for you to enter heaven. A second door is open for you at this particular moment of salvation. An open door to your God-given potential. But many people don't bother to go through that second door of finding out their full potential because they are too busy enjoying their sobriety and the freedom of salvation. Many people only get saved and they stay saved and that's it. They never open that other door. The door to, to, to finding the true potential that God has for your life. They just stay enjoying the nice car, the nice house, the nice job. The nice, perhaps new wife. Hello. What? Yes, I tell you why. Because while you was walking with the enemy, the enemy took everything from you. The enemy took everything from you. Now that you get saved, God begins to give you things back and bless you. God doesn't want you so occupied and preoccupied with the blessings he's given you. He wants you to keep in mind the big picture. The big picture is that now you are in a position to become everything he called you to become. That he brought you to this world not only to be saved, but to use you as an instrument that you can expand his kingdom and reach others and make a difference in your family, in your community, and in your world by becoming everything that God wanted you to become. That's God's plan for your life. Many are satisfied with just being saved and one day making it to heaven. And that's a wonderful thing. But we need individuals that are going to lock arms together with us. See, if I would have just wanted to be saved, I would have stayed in Hayward where I was. I would have just kept on doing what I was doing. I had a nice business. I had established business. I had a few trucks. I was right there on, on, on mission, uh, established a nice business and everything. Man, I, I, I was getting into a place where, oh, man, finances are going to be good. I, had to, I was making trips every single year, two or three different trips over to, to uh, 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 Ensenada, Mexico and Rosarito and all those places. I take my kids. They, they were spoiled. Hello, somebody. But God says, are you going to enter through the second door? Not only of being saved, but to become what I called you to become. So that you can help other people and give hope to others. And I had to make a decision. My decision was like Mundo and Loris. God, use me, I go. Send me, I go. Let go of my business. Let go, give it to my little brother. You run with it, man. I'm... I'm going to pursue God's calling in my life. We're going to pursue God's calling. You see, my friend, God is calling us to another level. God wants you to be instrumental in reaching people. To be able to enter through the second door and be able to do what God has called you to do. There's a few who will discover the privilege of the open door that leads to their full potential in Christ Jesus. The devil will throw everything, including the kitchen sink, to hinder your advancement. When you want to do something for God. He begins by throwing an unhealthy view of yourself. Hello, somebody. He wants to still be, you know, come against you. And become a stumbling block in your life. He brings the unrepentant sin in your life. Unresolved yesterdays. Hello, somebody. He brings you with relational baggage. So that you will never become everything that God called you to become. Relational baggage, problems, and relationships that will keep you from your full potential. It will pollute your relationships with other people. It will make you defensive and distant from people. And then it will make you demanding and, and destroy relationships still. That's what the enemy does. But as I close, number three, there on your outline, we're able to see that David defeated the Philistines at Belparasim, the Bible says. And when you study the word that Belparasim, and you're able to see exactly what it means, this is what the word means. Belparasim means the Lord of the breakthrough. That's what the word means, the Lord of the breakthrough. See, Saul and his son had dealt and fought the Philistines for many years. David just became king 
And the Philistine says, let's destroy him before he becomes everything. So they came and they confronted each other. And the Bible tells us that David destroyed the Philistines there, Abel Parasim. And when he destroyed them, the Bible says he destroyed them at Bel Parasim, and it means the Lord of the breakthroughs. David knew that as long as you stay obedient to the Lord, that as long as you stay faithful to God, at some point in your life, there's going to be major breakthroughs that God is going to bring your way. David knew that that was the specific time and hour that God wanted to bring a major breakthrough to the entire nation. Now listen. This would be the beginning and it will be a door that will be open for years to come. This was an opposition that had been there. That This was their headache for a long time, for years. And now God says, I'm going to give you the breakthrough that you've been needing these many years so that you can enter into a brand new future. Where you're going to take nations, where you're going to take cities, where you're going to raise up soldiers, where you're going to be one of the most powerful kings in the land, where you are going to fight for my people like never before.